Johnny Dollar. This is Frederick Keeley at Masters Insurance and Trust Company. How are you, Mr. Keeley? I... Oh, I'm fine, thank you, but that's rather beside the point. I have a bit of a problem, Mr. Dollar. Haven't we all? Yeah? Beg your pardon? Nothing, sir. Just go on, please. But, Mr. Dollar, one of our claimants, that is to say the beneficiary of a small insurance policy, apparently never received the check for $3,000 we sent him. I'm afraid I don't get it, Mr. Keeley. Why call on me? What do you mean, sir? Well, all you have to do is call the bank, stop payment on that check, and issue another. I'm afraid not, sir. Why not? I said apparently never received it. I use that word advisedly. Well? Because it so happens the check we sent him has been cashed. Oh. Yes, properly endorsed and apparently cashed by the claimant, the beneficiary himself. Apparently again. Yes, and again, I use the word advisedly. Well, then it kind of means one of two things. Either this beneficiary is trying to collect the money twice... Yes. ...or somebody else got to that check first... In which case, we have a little matter of forgery on our hands. Which, of course, should exact the fullest possible penalty of the law. Will you look into it for us? Sure, Mr. Keeley, why not? CBS Radio brings you Bob Bailey in the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Masters Insurance and Trust Company, Home Office, Hartford, Connecticut. Following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the double exposure matter. Expense account item one, $1.20 for a cab to Keeley's office on the 10th floor of the Star Record Building. He's a man of about 60, I'd say, short, stout, and uh, rather pompous in his manner. Or maybe self-important is more like it. No, I'm sure you realize as well as I do that a $3,000 claim is relatively small. Relatively unimportant. I use that word advisedly. Well, that means I can't expect much of a commission. Uh, huh? What's that? Uh, nothing, sir. Go ahead, please. Yes. Well, the fact remains that if the claimant, the beneficiary, thinks he can get away with collecting twice on the policy... Seems to me he'd have to be pretty stupid to try a thing like that. Oh, you're right. You're entirely right, sir. Exactly the way I feel about it. And Peter Upman is not a stupid man, so far as I have been able to determine. Upman? The beneficiary. Oh. In other words, it becomes evident, and I use that word advisedly, that someone else got hold of that check, endorsed it with Peter Upman's name, signed the receipt, of course, and, uh, shall we say, left for parts unknown? In other words, we are faced with a case of forgery. Yeah, I uh, think I suggested something of that sort. Eh? Uh, why, yes, yes, of course you did. And forgery is a serious matter, sir. I'll go along with you on that. Not only in this particular instance, because of the relatively small amount involved, and I use that term advisedly, oh, I'm sure you but do. because it could lead to other attempts where perhaps much larger amounts could be involved. So you want me to see if I can run down this forger for you? No. No? Why do you say that? If we are to believe the People's National Bank over in Milford... Milford, Connecticut? That's right. If we are to believe them, the personnel concerned, their actual photographic record of the transaction, there was no forgery. But I thought you just finished saying... What's that? Mr. Dollar, according to them, and I have no reason to doubt them in the least, Peter Upman himself appeared, endorsed that check, cashed it, and left with the money. However... Yeah. I have here a properly signed deposition to the effect that Upman not only never cashed that check, but that he never saw it. Oh, oh, no, this doesn't make sense. We have no reason whatsoever to question the validity of this deposition. You're sure of that? I am certain of it. But, but you can't be. That is why I have called upon you. Somehow, Mr. Dollar, you must bring the criminal, whoever he is, to justice. Will you do it, sir? Well... Yeah, sure. Why not? And I use that term advisedly. Naturally, my first move was to drive on down to Milford. On the expense account, that rings up item two, five and a quarter for a tank full of gas for my own car. The People's National Bank was closed for the day, so I registered at the Milford Arms, ate some dinner, that's item three, another five and a quarter. That is, including a couple of drinks beforehand. Then I drove over to the address of Mr. Peter Upman. 
Pete, living alone in a small apartment on East Willow Drive, turned out to be about uh, 33. He was tall, husky, good-looking. The football type with a big shock of red hair. Very nervous, though. The kind who doesn't stay put anywhere for very long. Yeah, sure. Come in, darling. Sit down, sit down. Okay. How about if I pour us a drink or something? How about it? No, no thanks, Upman. Upman? Sure you don't mean Mr. Upman? <laughs> now, don't be so formal. Just call me Pete. Sure you couldn't do with a little drink just to sort of celebrate. How about it, huh? Celebrate what? Celebrate what? You said the insurance company, didn't you? That's right. Then produce, man, produce. Just don't keep me hanging here. Only I'll sit down, too. Come on, man. Come on. Let's have it, huh? What are you talking about? The check. What else? Old Aunt Lizzie's insurance. Don't tell me you came all the way down here from Hartford without bringing me another check for all that lovely money, that three grand. Now, don't tell me that. Oh, another check, huh? Why, sure. What else? <laughs> hey, now, look what I mean. Is... Yeah. Now, what do you mean, Pete? I mean another one to take the place of the one the company was supposed to send me, but I never got it. That's what I mean. They said they sent it to me, but, man, I never saw it. Oh, they sent it all right, and they got a receipt for it. That's what they say, man. That's what they've been saying to me ever since I put on that claim for it. Now, oh, look. Maybe the Upmans are kind of funny about some things, but they aren't liars, see? And I'm telling you, I never got that check. Pete, that check... You was... don't believe me? You asked that lawyer, that Alfred R. Price. He took my statement and made me swear to it. So I and I don't swear to something unless it's true, see? That's all very swear well, Swear to but... something isn't true is a one-way trip to the jailhouse. A man, that's not for me. I'm beginning to wonder... Sure, that's the fastest way to get yourself into trouble, but... Now, oh, look, Dollar. You be careful what you say. Yeah. I'm a nervous man, darling. Sometimes I got a pretty quick temper. And if somebody's trying to pull a fast one on me, well, don't try it. I don't care who you are. Just don't try it, darling. Maybe it wouldn't be very healthy for you. See what I mean? Uh, is that supposed to be a warning, Pete? Warning? No. No, man, I don't fool around. That's a threat. <laughs> Pepsi-Cola refreshes without filling. Why? Because it's truly light. Charlie, you're forgetting something. Wait, Kay, there's more. Yes, ice-cold Pepsi is the delicious refreshment that goes great at a picnic or a party. But, Charlie... And Pepsi goes fast. People like it, so keep plenty handy. There. Oh, you did fine, except for one thing. Well, I mentioned lightness and how Pepsi refreshes and how fast it goes. You left out Pepsi sociability. You know the Be Sociable song. But, Kay, I can't sing. I can Listen. Be sociable, look smart, keep up to date with Pepsi, drink light, refreshing Pepsi, stay young and fair and debonair, be sociable, have a Pepsi. Well, at least I can say this. Pick up an extra carton of Pepsi today. Please do. And now, act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Trying to reason with Peter Upman didn't work. He was much too anxious to use his fists. And from the looks of him, he might have done very well with them. He maintained he'd never received the insurance check. That he wanted the money, wanted it fast, and that's all there was to it. That I had my choice of getting it for him or else. He made it plain that if I didn't like his attitude, he'd be perfectly willing to pound some sense into my head. So, why stick my neck out? When I figured I could get all the information I needed from the lawyer, Mr. Alfred R. Price... And Price, living in a lonely home on the north side of town, was somewhat different from his hot-tempered young client. I'm, I'm afraid you just have to forgive Peter his somewhat belligerent attitude. He comes from a very wealthy family over in New Haven. I was their attorney for many years. They tried to spoil him, make him the same lazy, indolent sort that his sister and his two brothers are. One of those things, sir. But Peter would have none of it. He was determined to make something of himself entirely on his own. I see. As a result of his stubbornness, his defiance, and his father's unreasonable attitude, well, his father blandly told him he was cutting him off without a penny. Well, how do the other kids feel about him? Well, there's no love for him, believe me. But uh, how's he made out? Very well, Mr. Duller. He owns a little electronic shop. More important, he's the only member of the family who has any real knowledge of the value of money, simply because he's the only one who's gone to work for it. Which explains, I suppose, why he's so anxious to get his hands on the 3,000 insurance that his aunt left. Oh, he can use it, too. That is, if he hasn't already got it and is simply trying to bluff his way into another three grand. No, don't you believe it, Mr. Dollar. Peter would no more 
could no more think of such a thing. Well, you seem pretty sure of that. Well, I've known him since the day he was born. And have liked him in spite of his hot temper. And I'm absolutely certain he would never attempt anything out of line. Well, you're pretty convincing, Mr. Price. Well, after all, I'm a lawyer, Mr. Dollar. But the fact remains the company sent him a check. It was properly endorsed. The money was paid out. But not to him. But well, how can you be sure? Because he says it wasn't. And that's good enough for me. But in that case... Have you talked to the people at the bank, to the teller who made the payment? No, no, I haven't. Have you seen the photograph of the actual transaction as it took place? So you're the second one to mention such a photograph. Uh, very ingenious device there at that bank. I suggest the first thing in the morning you go down there, see it, talk with the president, Mr. Oliver, and then see what you think. So first thing in the morning, I was at the bank talking with Mr. Barton Winfield Oliver, the president. Yes, a very ingenious device, Mr. Duller, when it works properly. Oh, what do you mean by that, Mr. Oliver? It's called a photo register. One of the very first models to be installed in a place of business. Actually, it was an experimental model. Well, just what is it? What does it do? Comparable devices, much improved, of course, are in use throughout the whole country now. What does it do, sir? It automatically takes a picture of everyone who steps up in front of the teller's cage. Oh, yeah, I think I've heard of such things. Of course. Yeah, aren't they used in a lot of supermarkets, places like that, to make a photographic record of people who cash checks in them? Yes, and as a result, the incidents of bad checks in those places, <laughs> why, they're almost a thing of the past. All this means that you have a picture of the man who cashed that insurance check. Uh, well, uh, yes, yes, I have. May I see it, please? Well, uh... Yes? Because if it is a picture of young Peter Upman, I don't care what his lawyer says. Here you are, Dollar. This is photographic proof it was he who... Who... Huh? Uh, yes. Oh, now, wait, wait a minute. Well, that was an you early... You to say this is the best that fancy machine of yours can do? It was an experimental model. Why, this could look like almost anybody. In the beginning, it was very good. Made very clear pictures. Well, it certainly doesn't anymore. But only the head cashier and I know that. Huh? The general public don't. They think it operates as well as ever. So it serves its purpose. Yeah, how? Because anyone thinking of trying anything is scared by it. Oh, great, great. Then this photo doesn't really mean a thing. Oh, sure, in a way, it does look somewhat like Peter Upman. Same bill, same general sort of face, even the same shock of hair. But it's so blurred, so indistinct, like a double exposure. I, uh, yes, yes, I know. But when Mrs. Eberhardt says that it was Peter... Who's uh, Mrs. Eberhardt? She's one of our oldest, most trusted employees, the teller who waited on him. Oh, let me talk to her, please. Certainly. Oh, Mrs. Eberhardt... Will you close your cage for a moment and come here, please? Let it be, Mr. Oliver. That's the one? It is. She's been with the bank much longer than even I have. Almost from the beginning. She knows more about the people here in... Mr. Dollar, what does this mean? I casually pull my gun out of its holster. And I held it casually in front of my chest, waiting for Mrs. Everhart to come over. Because I'd had a real good look at her when she turned to answer Mr. Oliver. And suddenly, I began to see things a lot more clearly. Talk about best-selling records. Here's a familiar tune about America's best-selling filter cigarette, Winston. That's because only Winston has filter blend up front. Choice, flavorful tobaccos, specially selected and specially processed for filter smoking. No wonder Winston tastes good. Like a cigarette should. Smoke Winston. And now, act three of yours truly, Johnny Dollar and the double exposure matter. Oh, that revolver. 
Just take it easy, Mr. Oliver, and don't mention it to her when she comes over here. But good heavens, man. Wait now, wait now. Here she comes. Yes, Mr. Oliver, you wish to... I'm so sorry, Walter. Okay, okay, Abby. Only I'm not Waller, I'm Jim. Oh, yes, of course, Jimmy. Right over here, Mrs. Everhart. Oh, I know, Mr. Oliver. I can do it. Oh, dear, these chairs are all over the place. Ebby, um, I want you to meet my friend, Mr. Johnny Dollar. Oh, Mr. Johnny. Oh, oh I am so sorry. I didn't mean to bump into you, uh, Mr. Sorry, Dollar. Sorry. But how do you do? Oh, and I see you smoke a pipe, too, just like Mr. Oliver does. Yeah, oh, you'd better take a real close look at this, Mrs. Everhart. What? The way you look real close at all the money you handle there at the counter, at the deposit slips and so forth. A real close look, huh? Uh, uh, oh, why, it's a pistol. Yeah. But good heavens. How long since you've had a new prescription for those glasses of yours? Oh, look here, young man. If this is a hold How long? Shall I cry for help, Mr. Oliver? No, no, Ebby. Better answer my question. Young man. I don't see that it's any of your business. I thought so. And if you're here in the bank for any nefarious... And this is the person who identified Peter Upman for you. Now, look here, Dollar. Yes. You look here, young man. Look, huh? That's right. Mr. Oliver, hasn't this bank of yours got a nice, generous pension plan for an old and faithful employee who's blind as a bat? <gasps> I think so. Item four, ten cents for a telephone call to the lawyer, Mr. Price. Item five, a buck and a half for a leisurely lunch at the hotel, after which I wandered around the town a bit, then drove on over to the lawyer's office. I uh, tried to call you at the hotel, Mr. Dollar, but they told me you'd left. Yeah, no, I was out taking a little walk. <clears throat> Look here. Uh, do you think these will be of any help to you? Who knows, but I certainly hope so. Now, this is Janet Upman. I believe she's about 31 now. Mm, oh, we oui. Quite a dish. Yes, yeah, she's... <laughs> Quite a dish. I bet that mink set her back a lot of money. Now, uh, this is Edward, Peter's older brother. Not very bright. Kind of bald, isn't he? But there is a family resemblance. And this is Peter. Oh, no, 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 that's Paul. A couple of years younger than Peter. I said they resent, uh, they dislike Peter, didn't you? Yes, I did. Because he had the guts to go out on his own, huh? Mm, partially, perhaps. Because he didn't take a hunk of the family fortune? Well, that wouldn't make sense. Now, wait. You mean I... Oh, uh, didn't I tell you of the hidden bequest? The what? Peter never knew about it, but the others always have. Known about what? Well, because of the way Peter had renounced his family, his father wanted to punish him. By cutting him off without a cent. So he said. But in a late codicil to his will... Oh, Peter will get some money, huh? Over a million, Mr. Dollar, in a few months, when he's 35. I see. Provided he keeps out of any serious trouble. Uh, the money the others were left. Millions, Mr. Dollar. I'll bet they've been going through it like a tornado. Yes, I'm afraid so. All right, then, Mr. Price, if I can bluff my way with this picture from the bank, and if you're any kind of an actor, well, let's get busy. I telephoned to Peter, told him to come over. Mr. Price called the others. Uh, they didn't care particularly about seeing Pete again, but Price told them some of the as-yet undistributed money was at stake, and they quickly changed their mind. So... About an hour and a half later, there was a gathering of the Upman clan there at the office of the old attorney. Uh, look, Dollar, Mr. Price says you're okay and all that, but I still don't like your company's stall on the insurance payment. Just keep your shirt on, huh, Pete? And another thing, I didn't like your attitude when you came to see now, me. Now, look, look, you may be a little bigger than I am, but I've decided you'd be very foolish if you tried to take me on. Oh, yeah? It might even cost you a million bucks. Well, all I care about is Aunt Lizzie's 3000 Okay, okay, just take it easy. Huh? Take it easy? You say that to a oh, redhead? Oh, then shut up. Okay, now, all of you, listen to me. Yes, Johnny? I'm sure you all know that Pete here inherited a few thousand dollars from his Aunt uh, Elizabeth, I guess it is. Yes, and we've heard about how he's tried to collect it twice over. Well, if you ask me, Johnny... Thank you, Janet, but I am not asking you. Well, if you ask me, Pete ought to be locked up for trying such a silly, childish thing. Yeah? Paul, with all the time in the world on your hands, it was really easy for you to pick up that insurance check over where Pete lives while he was at work, wasn't it? What's that? I what? And forging a signature? Well, after all, you're his own brother. Just a minute, please. And there at the bank, why, dear old half-blind Mrs. Everhart couldn't tell which was which. Now, look here, Donald. But 
A little machine put the finger on you, Paul. Oh, absurd. Yeah, a little device at the bank that photographs everybody who goes up to a teller's cage. Oh, you mean that... Oh, now, Johnny, you've been taken in. Have I? That old thing is just a bluff. It hasn't worked right in years. Oh, what makes you think that? I know, because the cashier is a, well, a boyfriend of mine. Oh, the bank had better check its books. What? He didn't tell you it's been fixed recently? Fixed? No. No, he didn't. I, I mean... Oh. Now, wait a minute. Like to see the picture it took of you, Paul, collecting that money? Yeah. Here, Mr. Price, see what you think. Hmm. Why, yes, Mr. Dollar. It's about as clear as it can okay, possibly... Okay, Paul, you oh, dirty... No, no, stop him. Somebody stop me. And not you, Paul, or anybody else. Wait. <laughs> Good heavens, Mr. Dollar. Peter will kill him. Oh, I doubt it, Mr. Price. Can you think of a better way for justice to be done? Yeah. Peter paid Paul on this one. But I mean, royally. And I must confess, it did my heart good to watch him. And Pete, bless his fighting Irish heart. Yep, he'll be a millionaire one of these days. He's earned it. Expense account total, including hotel and food, $17.20. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Our star will return in just a moment. Constipation is something people don't talk about much. But it can be a problem for anyone, even doctors. And when constipation occurs, it's interesting to see just what doctors consider important about a laxative they might use or recommend. Well, a majority of the doctors we heard from had this to say. A laxative should be effective, gentle, close to natural acting. A medicine that can be used with complete confidence. Now, Exlax has been popular with many doctors and millions of people over the years because pleasant-tasting chocolated Exlax is effective. Overnight, it helps you toward your normal regularity. Exlax is so gentle, so close to natural acting, there's no upset. That's why many doctors and millions of people use Exlax with complete confidence. Exlax, the laxative that helps you toward your normal regularity gently. Overnight. Now, here is our star to tell you about next week's story. Next week, a story of a deadly swamp and four dedicated killers. Their intended victim? Well, join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, originates in Hollywood and is written, produced, and directed by Jack Johnstone. Heard in our cast were Marvin Miller, Peter Leeds, Jack Moyles, Ralph Moody, Bartlett Robinson, Eleanor Audley, and Sandra Gould. Be sure to join us next week, same time and station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. This is John Wall speaking. Silent Death stalks a ship's corridor as suspense follows on the CBS radio network. One more pitch may do it. Judy Wood has been pitching a great game all afternoon. She's just about the best softball pitcher in the women's league. Okay, she's ready. Strike three! Man, oh man, what a pitch! Man, oh man, a Shevitz, what a wine! At the ballpark, not everybody gets the big cheers. But at home, everybody's wine is always cheered. It's Manischewitz. Man, oh, man. Man, oh, Manischewitz. Everybody's wine because it tastes so good. Have you tried new Manischewitz fruit wines? It's just like drinking fruit itself. Serve them anytime. Manischewitz fruit wines. 100% pure, specially sweetened. Blackberry wine. Cherry wine. Loganberry wine. Man, oh man, a chef, it's everybody's wine because it tastes so good. Man, a chef, it's wine company, New York. Radio 59, WROW, Albany, New York.